So in 1796, Washington decides, I'm not running again. The United States is on the verge of war with France. It's fighting internally. You've got these two political parties. They're at each other's throats. The Republicans are basically going to look at the Federalists and say, you signed Jay's treaty. You turned your back on France. Um, you bent the knee to Britain. The Federalists are going to come back and try to argue, you know, this was necessary. We needed to do it. And then France is going to be across the ocean, basically threatening war. Look like this new United States under this constitutional government is, is going to rip itself apart. You start to see the tears in the seams. Again, maybe if Washington had run for a third term, things had come back together. Things wouldn't have ripped further apart. But as we're about to talk about, that's not going to be the case. He chooses not to run in 1796. The person that is going to be president is going to end up being John Adams. Tiny bit about John Adams. He is from Massachusetts. Um, he'd actually made his name before the American Revolution. He'd supported the revolution from the beginning, although he was kind of more of an elitist. He uh, uh, didn't like some of the mob violence that occurred during the American Revolution. Uh, cousin Sam Adams, he uh, disagreed with some of his tarring and feathering and things like that. So John Adams um, had been there from the start. He'd actually uh, earned some opposition in Massachusetts because he defended some of the soldiers that had participated in the Boston Massacre. But then after that, he went on to support the, the revolution, and he served in a, a series of government positions from that point forward. Well, after the American Revolution, he's going to serve Massachusetts under the Articles of Confederation, and then um, he'll serve uh, the Articles of Confederation government as ambassador to England. After that, he will run with Washington as VP. Again, as we talked about before, presidents and vice presidents were chosen by these electors. He gets the second number of votes after Washington's unanimous uh, amount of votes in 1789. Uh, and then, as we talked about, Adams uh, will, will uh, take over as VP, and he's going to continue to serve as VP in Washington's second term. Well, as Washington's VP, vice presidents don't really have much to do. So he's, I don't want to say he's a figurehead, but he's basically just there for support. He doesn't have much political power. But what politics he is involved in, he will be Federalist. Basically, Adams, he felt that, similar to Hamilton, that there were the elite and the mob. He thought that the vast majority of people were uneducated, they were incapable of rational thought, and you need to do a little bit to control them. Now, Adams, he differentiates from Hamilton in, in some ways, like uh, he thinks uh, you need to keep the elite reined in in certain ways, and it was part of the U.S. government's responsibility, not just to help the elite, but just to make sure to keep them under control so they don't um, hurt the people. So, he, he was a Federalist, and, but the thing is, he wasn't an uber-Federalist like Hamilton. So in general, he's going to support Hamilton's measures, but he won't go as far as Hamilton in some, some ways. And as a matter of fact, Adams doesn't personally like Hamilton. The two disagree with one another on a number of issues. And part of this, this is because Hamilton is Hamilton. He just um, can be very straightforward he doesn't mince words it could also be Adams Adams very jealous type of guy he uh, uh, what would he say like he basically said history is going to remember the American Revolution as Benjamin Franklin's lightning rod striking the ga uh, ground and out springs George Washington because he, he basically says that because he felt like that nobody was going to remember his contribution to the revolution um, when, he, when he was over serving a, a Britain uh, in France to encourage France uh, to get involved in the revolution so basically Adams, jealous type of guy, a little bit insecure. This isn't something you want in a politician. It's a guy that's insecure, and uh, Adams certainly was. He thought that everybody was out to get him. He would uh, take political disagreements personally, uh, and he could be petty at times. You're not supposed to be petty. You're supposed to be compromising as a politician, but Adams could certainly be petty. But the thing was, he was Washington's VP, 
Washington liked him because he wasn't as extreme as Hamilton. And when he steps out in 1796 or decides not to run again in 1796, he's going to look at people to take over for him. He thinks Hamilton's too controversial. Although he agrees with Hamilton on most things, he sees these party divides, and he doesn't think that Hamilton would be good as uh, the next president of the United States. But Adams, somebody who, again, would be more in line with uh, Washington. Uh, Federalist leanings, but not extreme Federalist leanings like Hamilton. Um, not as controversial. He thinks Adams would make a good replacement for him. So in 1796, he's going to encourage the electors to choose John Adams. So as we talked about, the way the electoral college system worked was every state gets a certain number of electors. And the way you choose them is, uh, you know, you have Virginia. Again, just playing with numbers here. 10 times the population of Georgia. They have 10 House of Representative members. They have two senators. So that's 12. So they're going to get 12 electors. Each state, Georgia will get three for two senators, one House of Representative member. Each state sends their electors. So it's just the state legislatures pick qualified people, and they send them to pick the next president. So Washington's going to make clear that he wants Adams to take over for him when these electors are going to be sent out. But here's the thing by 1796, not every state is going to do things the way it was originally intended in the Constitution. Again, it was states supposed to pick their electors. Owing to Jefferson's encouragement of democracy, certain states, like Virginia, had begun to allow their people, through a popular vote, to choose who the electors were going to vote for. Okay? So... Virginia would hold an election in 1796. The people would go to vote, and they would basically say, who would you prefer for president, X person or Y person? Whoever the people voted for, the Virginia state legislature would then say to their electors, go vote for this person. So they started doing things differently owing to this Republican push for democracy. That's closer to the way most states do it today, or all states in the United States do it today, is the people choose then the state tells the elector to go choose it. That wasn't the way it was originally intended in the Constitution, but because of these party divides and because of this push for democracy, you've seen some states do it this way. Now, some of the states that do it this way have property restrictions on who can vote for, who the electors vote for, but you do see some states um, having lifted these property restrictions. So Washington's going to tell uh, the people, uh, the electors, hey, vote for John Adams. <coughs> now, the thing is, not all Federalists like John Adams, and as we mentioned, Alexander Hamilton in particular doesn't like John Adams. They just disagree with each other on some minor political issues, but they don't like each other personally. So, and also, Hamilton, you might do this, uh, see a little bit of jealousy there, the fact that Washington endorsed him instead of Hamilton. So, when the, this election, again, this weird style election where these electors go pick who they want, um, when they go to meet, Hamilton is going to start privately encouraging some Federalists, some people that are associated with the Federalists, some of the electors, to throw away one of their two votes for John Adams. So basically the way the Federalists are going to set this up is they're going to encourage any Federalist elector to put one of their votes for John Adams, one of their votes for a guy named Thomas Pigney. You don't need to know about Thomas Pigney. We're going to talk about uh, his cousin Charles in a little bit here. But basically, the way that the Federalist Party understands it is if you're a fed uh, elector who supports a Federalist, one of your votes goes for Adams, one goes for Pigney, and Adams is going to get they're going to have one particular elector throw away one vote for Pickney, so Adams will get the majority of elector votes. Uh, Pickney will get the second number of elector, elector votes. Well, Hamilton doesn't want Adams to become president. He would prefer Thomas Pickney to become president. So behind the scenes, he's going to start encouraging some of these Federalist-leaning electors to throw away their vote for Adams. And what Hamilton's thinking is that Right now, at this point, we think that we have more electors than the Republicans. So when the electors vote, you know, enough votes will be thrown away for Adams that Pickney will become president, Adams will become vice president, and I think this is going to be better for the Federalist Party. Unfortunately for Hamilton's tinkering, there's going to be two guys that are going to be actively running for the Republicans as uh, their candidates for president and vice president. 
again, they there wasn't intent this intention to have people run in presidential re elections. It was generally going to be that uh, the electors just chose qualified people. But we see this party politics. So when the 1796 election comes up and it's clear Washington's not running, Jefferson's going to start telling any Republican-leaning uh, elector, hey, you should vote for me for president, and we're going to get everybody else to vote, or we're going to... One of your votes for me, Jefferson, give your other vote to this guy, Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr is this Republican Party member they picked up from New York. The reason they're going to put him as VP under Jefferson isn't necessarily because Burr and Jefferson uh, believe on, on uh, the same on everything. As a matter of fact, Burr's political leanings are a little bit unclear. They, they basically see Burr as a way to get some electors from New York to vote. So we have big state of Virginia represented by Jefferson, big state of uh, New York by uh, Burr. So they're going to tell the electors, vote for us. It's not going to be campaigning like we would traditionally think. It's just they're behind the scenes saying, we want to win instead of uh, Adams and Pickney choose Jefferson and Burr. Well, by 1796, the Republican Party isn't doesn't have as many electors as the Federalist, but owing to Hamilton's tinkering, what you're going to see is when the electors meet, everybody's going to cast their two votes, but when the Federalists go to cast, Hamilton's tinkering gets a couple people to throw away the votes for Adams, but some Federalists had learned about this tinkering, and they'd throw, thrown their votes away from Pickney instead because they would rather have Adams become president and Pickney uh, become vice president. That's the way it was intended to be. Well, because of this, you're going to see enough people will throw away their votes for Pickney, not enough to where uh, you know uh, you know that that uh, the the Federalists aren't going to win. Not, not enough throw it away for Adams. He's going to win the presidency. He's going to get the most number of electoral votes. But the second number of electoral votes is going to end up going to Jefferson. Let me actually read the uh, numbers here. So electors, they go and vote. They each get two votes. Whoever gets the most number of votes becomes president. Whoever gets the second number of votes becomes vice president. And then uh, the result's going to be that, um, uh, where is the exact numbers here? Oh, well. Oh, yeah, here we go. Uh, Adams gets 71. Jefferson gets 68. Pigney gets 59. Again, Hamilton was saying, throw away your votes for Adams. People heard about that and instead threw their votes away for Pickney. This allows Jefferson to come in second in the votes. So what this means for Adams is he still becomes president. He's not worried about that. But instead of having fellow Federalist Pickney as his VP because of Hamilton's tinkering and the counter-tinkering, he's now going to have Thomas Jefferson as his vice president. So I want you to think about this. It's 1796. This election just happened, and we're going into 1797, which is going to be when Adams starts serving his first term. You're Adams. You have a lot of problems. Not only is France threatening war, and as we're going to see, they're going to essentially declare war in 1797, but you have members of your own party who don't like you personally tinkering to try to deny you from power, and now that has led to your the leader of your rival party, the Republicans, being your vice president. So Adams not only has dissension within the Federalists, he's got the other political party as, as head as his VP, and he's got um, he's got the French who are threatening war. You know, it's kind of interesting because Adams and Jefferson, they're actually somewhat friendly. Now, they believe very different things on the political spectrum. Again, Adams more elitist, Jefferson more man of the people democracy. Uh, but some people thought when these two get elected that maybe they could actually work together. That's quickly going to go out the window, and it's going to be clear that Jefferson's going to be pushing for Republican stuff, and Adams is going to be pushing uh, sort of this Federalist agenda. All right, John Adams, you've got these problems. How are you going to deal with it? Well, major problem comes in because the second the election's over and it's clear that Adams is taking over, France is going to authorize its ships, so its naval ships and its merchant ships, to begin attacking American vessels. Now, they had been waiting until the end of the results of the 1796 election because basically they wanted, if Jefferson won, they thought Jefferson could get rid of Jay's Treaty and then, you know, go back to being 
peaceful with France, supporting the French economically. But now that the Federalists have won, they realize Jay's Treaty is to stay. Now, Jay's Treaty, we didn't mention it, but it's a, for a period of 10 years. So now they're looking at it. Nothing's going back on that. These guys are siding with the British of, economically, and they're supporting the Federalists. The Federalists have won this election. So we don't want these guys trading with the British and we want them, you know, they're obviously with Jay's Treaty, the trade is going to be limited with France. So the French say, if you see an American vessel, you can basically assume it's trading with the British and you can start attacking it. So you're going to see, beginning in 1797, this quasi-war that will last for the next two years where the French, French naval vessels, French merchant ships will start attacking American naval vessels and American merchant ships at, on the ocean. France isn't going to officially declare war although uh, part of the reason is because they're busy over fighting with everybody in Europe but uh, they are going to authorize their naval ships to attack and as we're going to see Adams is going to respond by allowing uh, authorizing American uh, naval vessels and American uh, merchant ships to attack uh, French shipping. As a matter of fact, the U.S. doesn't have naval ships just yet, we're, but we're about to see that happen. Uh, Adams first is actually going to try to send over three ambassadors to France to make peace with them. You know, he doesn't want to fight France, but uh, these uh, uh, three French uh, uh, diplomats will we meet with the Americans, and they're going to demand a bribe. Um, basically, the diplomats, the Americans call them X, Y, and Z because their names are French and hard to pronounce, so they just say X, Y, and Z. Uh, when the Americans get over to try to make peace with France, they ask for a bribe. The Americans refuse to give this bribe, and this is going to be this big uh, deal in the United States, this X, Y, Z affair. You kind of see this uh, here. This me lady's meant to represent Lady Liberty. She has an Indian headdress that you'll sometimes see uh, representing freedom, and you have these French guys sort of uh, 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 looking at her, and you've got these uh, other guys taking the, these uh, the wealth of these various nations, including the United States. So when this attempt fails, Adams is basically going to say, all right, we've got to fight these guys, not officially declaring war, but you can start attacking French ships if you see them American ships. He's actually going to authorize construction of the first naval ships in the United States. Um, so the U.S. during the American Revolution and afterwards, it didn't have naval ships, ships meant to blow up other ships. Basically, it's only naval vessels were converted merchant ships, fishing vessels, stuff like that. But he says, if we're going to be dealing with France, we need frigates. So he authorizes six uh, frigates to be built. And we see the birth of the United States Navy in 1997. Again, you'll, or 18, uh, 1797. You'll see some people claim uh, the birth a little bit earlier. But this is when you see the first naval vessels constructed by the United States. So now we have the United States and France essentially at war on the ocean. In the Atlantic, it's going to basically turn into this uh, undeclared naval war where French vessels and American vessels start blowing one another up. Uh, some 300 uh, American vessels are going to be destroyed or stolen by the French. A couple hundred French vessels uh, will be destroyed or captured by the Americans. Uh, this is going to be a pretty worrying uh, situation and actually Adams at one point is going to worry that the French might even invade the United States. That's going to be a fear. Uh, in 1798 he's actually going to call up George Washington. George Washington's been sitting at home just relaxing after this pretty tumultuous time. He's, he's sort of uh, getting back into the swing of things but Adams says to him, dude, I'm worried the French are going to invade. Can you uh, lead the U.S. Army in case they invade? So Washington briefly comes out of retirement. Um, he actually asks Hamilton or asks uh, Adams if Hamilton can be his right hand man. Uh, Adams says, "Fine, G.W. I don't know why you like that guy so much." Washington starts leading this army, and and actually they raise taxes on uh, temporarily on certain things to increase the size of this army up to 10,000 to watch for this French invasion. Almost immediately after taking it over, Washington is going to say, I'm done with this. I'm going back home. And he leaves Hamilton in charge of the army. So now John Adams not only has France attacking, he not only has uh, his the leader of the opposition party, the Republicans, as a VP, but the head of the army is his inter-party rival, Alexander Hamilton. So this is going to be uh, this pretty uh, scary situation. And as a matter of fact, you're going to start getting a lot of political infighting. Okay, um, 
So what's going to happen here once the French start attacking is Federalists will start looking at the Republicans and saying, you're the one that said support France. Now they're destroying American ships. Now they're capturing American vessels. Look, uh, you guys are, are jerks for supporting these guys. Well, the Republicans are going to come back. They wouldn't be attacking us if you didn't bend the knee to Britain. This is your fault. And you're going to get these attacks back and forth. So again, they have their political arguments, but now uh, things are going to get personal. This is uh, where, where things get really bad. This is actually right at the time that um, uh, the Republicans are going to decide we should just go ahead and release this information about Alexander Hamilton and his affair. Hamilton hears about it. He gets out in front of it and lets the information known uh, to the public before re Republicans can, can accuse him. He, he obviously would have uh, liked to keep the stuff private. Um, Hamilton basically heads things off because the Republicans were going to accuse him of actually being involved with the banknote scam, which Hamilton says, no, I slept with a married woman, well, slept around with my wife, um, but I, I didn't violate my oath as Secretary of Treasury. So uh, um, so uh, we got that going on. Uh, this is when accusations of Thomas Jefferson sleeping with his slaves is, are going to first come out. So Jefferson would have uh, people invited over to his home, uh, and a lot of people would notice that he paid particular attention to this one slave, Sally Hemings, and her children would be treated better than other children, and her children looked a lot like Thomas Jefferson, uh, and so a lot of people made that connection that Jefferson was sleeping with a slave, uh, and so they kept this information private until you start getting this real big political infighting in 1797, and it's at this point you'll start seeing people, this guy sleeping with a slave, which essentially is considered rape at the point. And so uh, uh, this this political cartoon uh, insinuates that Jefferson is like a rooster in a hen house or something uh, with his slaves. So the fighting is going to get so bad that you're actually going to have fist fights break out in Congress. Uh, there's two different uh, congressmen. One is uh, Matthew Lyon. He's a uh, Republican. There's a Federalist named Roger Gr uh, Griswold. Um, so Matthew Lyon, Vermont, considered West, and he's a Republican. He spits tobacco juice in the face of Matthew Lyon. Matthew Lyon gets mad getting his tobacco juice spit in his face. He's going to grab some pokers from the fire and try to hit Matthew Lyon with it. Lyon is going to uh, grab his cane and try to hit uh, uh, Griswold with it. Uh, and you're going to see this big fighting between Federalists and Republicans. That's depicted in this political cartoon here. You can imagine this would probably be the worst looking lightsaber fight of all time because I think both these guys are fairly old. Uh, I don't know if that's Thomas Jefferson watching it. I, I don't know who that big headed guy is, but uh, Royal Sport maybe. Like th this is insinuating this is almost like a dog fight or something like that. So Things are going to get bad. This is going to be leveled on Republicans are going to attack John Adams as well. John Adams being a Federalist, people will, you know, characterize him, even though they don't like each other, as, you know, Hamilton's uh, lackey. Uh, they're going to say, you know, you're the reason we're fighting with France. You know, you could have made peace, which, you know, probably couldn't have uh, unless you wanted to pay a bribe. Uh, but they're going to start calling Adams a lot of different names, personal attacks on him and his wife. Uh, things are going to get really out of control. This is when you truly see politics get personal and dirty. I mean, even today, you don't see this level of uh, vitriol. I mean, I guess you do sometimes. But 1797, 1798, things are going to get incredibly, incredibly bad. Again, to the point of fistfights. Well, Adams, being sort of this jealous, petty type, he can't stand the personal attacks. So what Adams is going to do is he's going to decide to use the force of law to prevent the personal attacks. And in 1798, he's going to enlist the help of Congress, which is uh, Federalist controlled at this time. So the Federalist and uh, you know the Adams Hamilton's party they control both houses of Congress at the time. He's going to get them to pass something called. The Alien and Sedition Acts. The Alien and Sedition Acts, right? So 1798, Congress will pass this Alien and Sedition Acts, and they're going to put it up on John Adams' desk to sign. 
So what the Alien and Sedition Acts will say is, well, let's go with the Alien Acts. Alien Acts aren't even really the most important part of this. The Alien Acts, uh, one of them will say you have to be in the United States for 14 years uh, before you can vote. The thinking here is that you know some people move from France. We don't want the French to be uh, participating in our elections, especially when we're seeing this expanded democracy. So we don't want the uh, the, the French to 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 participate in this voting. Another alien act will say that the president can deport somebody he suspects of working for a foreign government. A um, couple more of the alien acts, not as important, but basically this is just saying that. Uh, uh, that the United States can take action from foreign against foreign interference. That the alien acts aren't as controversial as the other part of these these acts, which is going to be the Sedition Act. So the Sedition Act, what this will say is that it is a crime, a high misdemeanor, to speak poorly against Congress and the President of the United States. So you cannot speak bad against the president or the United States Congress, okay? So we know why Adams is saying this political infighting doesn't like these accusations. The, they're going to justify this saying that that could be perceived as treason against the United States, undermining the effort to fight France in this quasi-war. Now, they'll justify it that way, but these, this Sedition Act is clearly and uh, pretty much everybody knows it at the time, a violation of the First Amendment. That Bill of Rights that we'd had the people argue in 1788 so vehemently, we want guarantees, there's no uh, limits, uh, restrictions on, on uh, uh, our, our right to free speech. Now this act is saying that you you cannot speak poorly about the President or Congress. Isn't that impede free speech? Well, at the time who interprets the Constitution? You had the Judiciary Act setting up the Supreme Court saying it could, uh, somebody accused of a laws could appeal up to the Supreme Court, but at this point the Supreme Court had not ruled anything unconstitutional. It had never exercised that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, power before. It had not done that, so Supreme Court's not going to be doing anything about this. So who determines constitutionality? Well, the way that the those who worked at the Constitutional Convention thought of things was the president, through their veto, should veto things that are unconstitutional. As we talked about, the veto wasn't supposed to be used like it is today to veto things that you don't like. It was only to be vetoing things that are unconstitutional. Well, here's something that's in, uh, obviously unconstitutional. So John Adams, being president, should hypothetically veto it, but he's not. He's one of the reasons that the this law uh, that they wanted this law in place because he didn't like to be talked smack about. So he's not going to veto it. So the law would be passed by both houses of Congress, and John Adams is going to sign it into law, making it illegal to speak poorly of the president or Congress. And I should point out, it says the president or Congress does not say anything about the vice president. You can criticize them as much as you want. And that's because who is vice president? Thomas Jefferson, a member of the opposition party. So talk as much smack about him as you want. So this law goes into effect. And this isn't one of those laws that's just on the books, but they never use it because they will absolutely use it. Um, about 25 different people will be tried under the Alien and Sedition Act. The vast majority are editors of those Republican-owned newspapers. So what you're going to have is these uh, various newspapers start printing articles criticizing the Sedition Act, criticizing John Adams, and this will be read, and then the uh, owners will be brought to trial, and they're going to face fines and, and um, uh, sm uh, short jail time uh, for talking smack about John Adams. Uh, Matthew Lyon, the guy that spit tobacco juice in the other guy's face, he serves time because he says John Adams uh, belongs in a madhouse. There's a story, and I don't know if this is true or not, uh, but supposedly there's a story where John Adams is in, uh, he's leaving the White House, or I guess it wouldn't be the White House, this is when the, it's still in Philadelphia, but he's uh, uh, leaving uh, his residence, and as he's leaving, they have a cannon salute. So, you know, the president's going by, we shoot a cannon off just to sort of honor him. Well, somebody shoots off the cannon as John Adams' carriage goes, goes by, and supposedly somebody nearby says, somebody should stick that cannon up John Adams' ass. 
John Adamson says, halt the buggy, has that guy arrested, and he's charged in the Alien and Sedition Act. So uh, this thing will actually be used. So you have this on the books. Now I want you to imagine that you're Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. You're the leaders of the opposition party. Your whole thing is you're afraid of this strong, powerful government, uh, the Federalists taking too much power. This absolutely looks like you know, that's happening. They have not only violated the First Amendment, who knows when they're going to throw out the Constitution. There are some Republicans thinking John Adams is going to try to make himself a king. Is this Constitution completely worthless? How do we respond to this? It's not like we can talk smack about them, because if we do, we're going to be charged under this thing, locked in jail. So Jefferson, Madison, and the Republicans are going to have to tiptoe in what they, how they respond to it. So what Madison and Jefferson will do is they're going to pass a series of re resolutions anonymously in the legislature of Virginia and Kentucky. So Virginia and Kentucky, um, they have their own state legislatures, pass the laws for the state, and they're going to pass these Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. Think about a resolution. It's not a bill. It's not a law. It has no power. It's just the Virginia and the Kentucky legislature saying what they believe. So Jefferson and Madison will author these Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. They're going to introduce them anonymously. So they're not going to put their name on them to the Virginia and Kentucky legislature. The legislatures will read them and they're going to sign off approving them. So they're going to author these Virginia and Kentucky resolutions as a response. What are the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions? Well, what they are is they're going to put forth the Republicans, particularly Jefferson and Madison's view of constitutional interpretation. So what Jefferson and Madison, and by the way, they're going to later sort of distance from what they're going to argue here, but what they're going to argue is that in these Virginia and Kentucky resolutions is that states made a compact to join this constitutional government. So by agreeing to uh, this constitution, states made a compact to join it. So you know, Virginia, Kentucky, Massachusetts, whoever, when they agreed to the Constitution, they made a compact to join it. Well, this compact theory of the Constitution uh, is going to put forth the idea because they agreed to this Constitution, to join the Constitution, then they can determine if the national government is going beyond the agreement of the Constitution. So if we agree to go to this Constitution, and then the national government oversteps its bounds or does something unconstitutional and passes an unconstitutional law like the Article, or I'm sorry, like the Sedition Act, states can choose whether or not to listen to it. They can nullify the law. So let me repeat that. They argue that states make a compact to form the Union. If the national government violates this compact, States, in, with a law that's unconstitutional, states can nullify that law and they don't have to listen to it. So what this does is it attempts to set up states as determiner of constitutionality. So not only can the president determine constitutionality according to this compact theory, states can as well. Supreme Court can, but n nobody's even think about that, that yet because they haven't uh, used that, uh, uh, that power just yet. So they put this forth. States can determine constitutionality. So hypothetically, and they, they're, it's not going to get to this point, but Virginia and Kentucky could nullify the Sedition Act if they choose to not listen to it, not enforce it, and really actively work against uh, it being put into power. So they put this idea out there. Now, they're not going to say this, but we're later going to see other politicians. This is going to be generations down the road, one or two generations down the road. We'll see some Southerners say, if states make a compact to form the Union and they can nullify laws if they deem they're unconstitutional, by making that compact, couldn't they choose to leave that compact if they want? So some people are going to interpret what Jefferson and Madison are saying as pushing this idea of secession. Now Jefferson and Madison are later going to say, we're not, that's not what we're pushing. We're pushing the idea of nullification, but we weren't pushing the idea of secession. But some Southerners uh, will ignore the fact that Jefferson and Madison said uh, they weren't pushing secession and will argue that they were arguing for secession. So Virgi uh, Virginia, Kentucky, they passed this. So now we have Adams having, to, now he's not getting criticized, but he's basically having states say, we don't have to listen to certain laws.
Hamilton's in charge of the army at this time. He basically is going to have to, he's going to go to Adams and say, Virginia and Kentucky are under rebellion. I'm going to take the army down there, take over their state legislature. Adams, you know, to his credit, it's like, again, he doesn't, doesn't like Hamilton. He's like, dude, calm down. You know, don't do that. You know, uh, you're pushing this thing too far. But that's another thing Adams has to deal with. So, again, uh, not just France attacking, you know, no Republicans uh, opposition to the Sedition Act, but now you have Hamilton in control of the army. So this is obviously bad for Adams. Well, fortunately for Adams, uh, things are actually going to get even worse because uh, uh, Washington, oh, so this is Washington handing over command of the army to Hamilton. Um, things are going to actually get even worse because Washington dies at this point, 1799, uh, and he'd been backing Adams up up to this point, but he uh, he gets sick and he dies, and uh, and so now Adams has to uh, uh, run things himself, doesn't have Washington's support. Thankfully for Adams, so United States is ripping apart at the seams. You know, Republicans are so upset with the Sedition Act. Uh, France is destroying their ships in the ocean. Thankfully for Adams. Somebody's going to come along and at least bring peace in, in one way. France, in 1799, at this point, had been going through 10 years of revolution, whether internal revolution or fighting Britain or fighting all these other countries of Europe. By 1799, the people of France are just exhausted. They've you know gone through all these different governments, constitutional monarchies, monarchies, anarchy, democracy, republic, democratic republic. And things have just been chaos, bloodshed everywhere. Well, by 1799, a lot of people in France are just saying, forget about our ideals, we just want peace. And for this reason, this is going to allow this one uh, general to take power in France. And we're going to be talking about this guy a lot uh, in, in, the, in a little bit here. But he's going to seize power in France in 1799. And simplified form he's going to end up taking power not becoming a monarch but he's going to start centralizing power around himself when he takes power in 1799 he's going to make peace brief briefly with britain and the other powers of europe but this new leader is going to understand that even though i'm at peace with britain it's only a matter of time before france and britain go to war again because that's what we do that's what we spend the 1700s doing we're both top dogs it's only a matter of time before we start fighting again and he's going to say, in order to better prepare for this next war, I need to get rid of all these smaller conflicts. And this guy is going to ask for peace uh, with the United States. So thankfully for this peaceful guy, this guy that loves peace, uh, we'll see this quasi-war come to an end. This peaceful guy is obviously not very peaceful. It's Napoleon Bonaparte, one of the guys that's going to be uh, uh, one of the... Uh, uh, biggest war guys in history, if not the biggest uh, uh, guy to, to lead uh, uh, armies into war. Uh, but he basically takes over power for France in 1799. And again, seeing a war coming with Britain in the future, thinks the United States, uh, a war with the United States, even though it's not an official war, it's just a quasi-war, as a waste of French resources. So he calls on Adams to stop attacking French ships, and he's going to tell the French not to attack American ships. So at least Adams has that um, going into uh, 1800. Well, 1800, you're, you're at peace with France, but again, you've got this opposition party that doesn't like your own party that's arguing with you. Well, Adams is going to decide to run for a second term. And when I say run, he actually is going to have to run this time because even more states, or right around the same amount of states, are going to uh, once again allow their people to vote for who their electors are going to vote uh, vote for. So he's going to be putting himself up for president in 1800, and Jefferson is going to be making clear that he's going to run against uh, John Adams. So if you don't like the Sedition Act, if you don't like the way Adams has handled things, then I'm the guy to vote for. Adams also has to go uh, going against him is the fact that he added some of these small temporary, but uh, the, the people are so upset about him, these taxes to pay for uh, these new naval ships to pay for an increase in the size of the army. People don't like that. So Jefferson's going to say, if you want an alternative to Adams, you should vote for me. So what you're going to see is by 1800, it's very clear if you're an elector or if you're in the states that allow the people to vote for who the electors are going to vote for, 
you've got one option over here in Adams, uh, and he's a Federalist option. You've got this other option over here in, uh, in, in for the Republicans and Thomas Jefferson. Well, Adams is going to be in a, again, he's going to have trouble in the fact that some people didn't think he handled the situation with France very well. A lot of people didn't like the Sedition Act. Um, and again, a lot of people thought this uh, he had passed these new taxes. They didn't like that, uh, that he'd done. Maybe Adams' biggest problem, though, is his own party. Once again, Hamilton, he sees that Adams is going to be running, and he doesn't like it. He just personally doesn't like Adams. Even though they're pretty much the same uh, politically, he thinks Adams is just a bad person. So what uh, when the uh, Federalists are going to be putting up their candidates in 1800, it's going to be Adams running for president, and he's going to be pushing for this guy, Charles Pickney, to be his VP. Once again, Hamilton would rather the Pickney be president than Adams, and so he's going to be encouraging those electors that are Federalist leaning in those states that are going to allow their people to vote to choose Pickney instead of Adams. And so what he's going to do is he will start to um, uh, tinker just like he did in the previous election, encouraging some electors to throw away their votes for Adams so Pickney can become president. Now, he doesn't know if this is going to have the desired result. So to encourage the Federalists not to put uh, Adams in yet again, he actually is going to publish a pamphlet, Hamilton does, uh, uh, talking smack about John Adams uh, shortly before the electors are going to pick who, who president is. In this uh, letter, he publishes in, in a number of newspapers called Letter from Alexander Hamilton Concerning the Public Conduct and Character of John Adams. Uh, Hamilton's going to call Adams, van say he has vanity without bounds and a jealousy capable of discoloring every object. And he just talks about Adams, again, a member of his own political party. Technically, Hamilton actually violates the Sedition Act, but Adams isn't going to have him prosecuted because how weird would that be to have um, the president prosecute a member of his own party shortly before an election? But Adams has that stuff going against him. And again, the Republicans in this 1800 election are unified. Basically, they've all realized if Adams stays president, we're going to get more stuff like the Sedition Act. That's just going to keep going. Um, you know, Adams had set the Sedition Act kind of smartly actually to expire in March 1801 with the next president set to take over in case he loses this election. But um, uh, but who knows? He'll probably renew that and we'll maybe see other violations of the Constitution. So Republicans are going to gather around. They're going to say, we absolutely have to win the presidency this time. What every state that allows popular vote should do is... You know, let's get the people out there. Let's have them vote for Jefferson. Tell their electors to put one of their votes for Jefferson, one of their votes for Burr. And they're going to tell those states where they don't, uh, they still just choose the electors. If you're a Republican leaning, choose Jefferson with one of your votes, choose one of your votes for Burr. Now they're going to tell uh, uh, one particular elector, you know, we whoever wins the first number of votes becomes president, whoever gets the second becomes vice president. So, uh, you know, one of the guys is going to be told to throw away their vote for Burr to make sure Jefferson's president. I mean, it's obvious that to everybody Jefferson's running for president. Uh, Burr's going to be serving as his vice president. So we've got to win this election. Again, the problem is some states, uh, you know, Republicans aren't as strong in states where the state legislatures choose electors. In some of those states where you're now seeing, again, what we do today, people uh, allow the people to vote for who the electors are going to vote for. Some of those states have property restrictions on voting. Uh, kind of a fun thing you actually see with that. Uh, New York's one of those state states. You have to own property to be able to vote. Aaron Burr starts a bank in New York and just starts handing out cheap property to people so they can be uh, they can vote because he knows they're going to vote for Republicans uh, if they if they vote. So you start to see all this, and in those states where again the people are going to vote, you actually see really the p first political campaigning that you, uh, uh, you you'll actually see. So um, you know, in in the states where you are going to have popular elections, Jefferson's going to go around, and he can't do this directly because he doesn't want to violate the Sedition Act. But the way that um, the Republicans will portray the Federalists is, if we get more John Adams, we're basically getting a king. You can just go ahead and give this up. 
uh, we're either going to go right back under Britain or John Adams is going to name himself a king. Um, we're going to be at war with France. Uh, that he's going to, you know, start the war back up again. He's going to install a monarchy. He's going to take that huge army he's put together and just use it to crush your liberties. Look, you got the Sedition Act. That's proof of it. Federalists are going to counter if and it's in those states where we're allowing the people to vote now that if Jefferson becomes president, anarchy is going to reign. You saw what happened in France the past 10 years. He's going to bring this to the shores of the United States. This guy's not a Christian. He's going to come around. And he's going to burn burn your Bible. Uh, you're going to see what you saw in France. Uh, you see children writhing on spikes on pikes. You're going to see women's chastity violated. Those are quotes. The the Federalists basically portray it, and they don't. They're not limited by the Sedition Act. They can just talk smack about Jefferson and accuse him of all these awful things. So, are you going to vote for Adams and have? peace or are you going to vote for Jefferson and have anarchy and then the Republicans are going to say are you going to vote for Jefferson and liberty or are you going to vote for Adams and monarchy it's it's really this dirty fighting for the first time and and again this is only when some states are allowing the popular vote well when the votes are going to be counted you're going to have Adams finishing third with 65 votes Pigney's going to finish with 64 votes. So Hamilton had tried to tinker around. That actually gets a couple guys to throw away their votes for Adams, but more throw away their votes for Pigney. So Adams gets more than Pigney, but they're going to get less than the Republicans. The Republicans are going to get 73 electoral votes for Jefferson, 73 for Aaron Burr. 73 for Jefferson, 73 for Burr. That beats Adams 65 and Pickney 64. So it looks like the Republicans have won. It looks like we're going to see this shift in power from Federalist to Republican. They've just won this Electoral College election in uh, 1800, and it looks like Jefferson's set to take over as president in March 1801. Now, there is one tiny problem, but it shouldn't be a problem. Basically, the Republicans had told one of their electors to throw away their vote for Burr so Jefferson could become president, Burr, Burr could become vice president. Everybody knew that was the way the Republicans were going to do this. Jefferson wanted to be president, and then Burr was understood to be uh, vice president. So this shouldn't be an issue, though, because all Burr would basically have to say is, you know, I'm, I'm accepting the VP position. Jefferson's clearly the president, and he just steps down and, and serves as VP. Unfortunately, when the votes are counted, Burr is going to look at him and he's going to say, wait a minute, so what does the Constitution say when there's a tie? Well, the Constitution says that the vote will then get thrown to the House of Representatives where every state is going to get one vote. So you'll have the House of Representative members for each state meet and they're going to discuss the candidates, then they're going to throw their vote to one person or another. By this point, there's 16 states in the union, so that means this vote will get thrown to the House. Well, Burr's going to decide, I think I want to be president, and I, I think this is my only opportunity to be president, and he's going to look at the House of Representatives, and he's going to realize that the Federalists control eight of the Houses of Representatives, they control the votes for eight states. So after it arrives at this tie, about to get thrown to the House where each state gets one vote, Burr is going to say to those Federalists, hey, you guys, if um, if you want me, uh, you know, I know I'm bringing for the Republican, but I don't really believe in the stuff Jefferson believed in. I, I kind of just did it because I thought this would get me into to politics. I thought this was a good way to the top, but... If you vote for me in the House, I'll do Federalist shit. I don't care. You know, I don't care if you vote for me in the House and I become president and Jefferson becomes vice president, I'll basically switch my political parties. Burr essentially stabs Jefferson and the Republican Party in the back to appeal to the Federalist. Well, the beginning of 1801, the vote will go to the House. The House is going to vote. And we see exactly which you could imagine, eight con states controlled by Republicans, all of these eight states are going to throw their votes to Jefferson. The states controlled by the Federalists, hey, we know Adams and Pigney aren't going to win this thing, 
But this Burr guy says that he will do what the heck we want, do Federalist stuff. So those eight states are going to throw their vote to Burr. So you have an 8-8 eight, eight tie. Well, what are you doing with the tie? You have another vote, according to the Constitution. Well, second vote, 8-8. Eight, eight. Third vote, 8-8. Eight, eight. Fourth vote, 8-8. Eight, eight. Fifth vote, 8-8. Eight, eight. There's going to be, what is it, 31 of these things. And it's going to keep coming out as a tie. 8-8. 8-8. 8-8. This is a problem because it's still this way by February 1801. The president set to take over in March 1801. What do you do if it's still a tie? Does Adams stay in office? I mean, it, it's not even clear. Do you, who takes over? What the heck is going to happen here? So this vote keeps happening, and it potentially could rip the country apart. Like, if the rules aren't making it clear, maybe it just splits and they go home. Maybe this new United States uh, is going to fall apart. So 8-8, eight, 8-8, eight, 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 eight. Well, before this can happen, we're going to see somebody step into this situation and bring resolution. And that's going to be Alexander Hamilton. So Hamilton, he's been watching from afar. He's been actually uh, uh, you know, given over command of the army that he had controlled briefly um, under John Adams. And he's returned to New York. He'd actually uh, been running the, the Federalist Party from behind. He'd uh, returned to private law. It's actually kind of interesting. In 1799, Burr had been private law for a little while. They mur wor worked on a murder case together. But he had been making a little bit of money. Back then, politicians didn't make enough money to live off of, so they would have to retire from politics briefly and make some money in private law and things like that. So Hamilton had been doing that. He sees this situation, and he's going to look, and he sees that one of the states that has been um, voting for Burr is New York, where Hamilton's from. That's where Burr's from as well. And Hamilton looks at this situation. He does not, Hamilton does not like Jefferson. I mean, it's ideological differences. He believes completely different than Jefferson about the future of the United States, how to interpret the Constitution. But Hamilton respects Jefferson as a person. Basically, he sees in Jefferson, this is a person who I don't agree with, but I truly feel that he believes that he's doing what's best for the United States. He's not selfish. He's not doing this for personal reasons. I don't agree with his vision, but I agree. I think that he, he thinks his vision is good, and, and he's not out for himself. Burr, on the other hand, to Alexander Hamilton, is dangerous he just shift political parties at the last second to get power. That's all. The way Hamilton sees that is, who knows what Burr's going to do once he gets power. You know, if he's willing to switch uh, parties like that, who's to say he's not just going to grab party uh, power, you know, form a government around himself, declare him Emperor Aaron the first, and uh, and then just just take over, uh, or just do what he wants, cause chaos. He basically sees Burr as dangerous. He thinks Jefferson bad ideas, but Burr he sees as dangerous. So Hamilton is going to start meeting behind the scenes with some of the members of the New York House of Representatives, one of uh, the Federalists that have been voting for Burr, and he's going to say, guys, you know I don't like Jefferson. I, he believes complete opposite to me, but I think he's a good person. I think Burr might do what we want, but he's a legit bad person. So what Hamilton will do is he's going to convince enough voters in New York to switch their vote to uh, Thomas Jefferson. And we're going to see, I believe it's the 32nd vote, the um, vote will go towards Thomas Jefferson. So the House will vote jo Thomas Jefferson to be the president, and Aaron Burr will be his VP. So once again, by the way, we have a president that uh, with a vice president they don't particularly get along with. But Jefferson will take over as president. Now, Jefferson, before we talk about the resolution with Hamilton and Burr, a couple things are going to come out of this election of 1800. One thing is that almost immediately after, there's going to be another amendment to the Constitution. There have been an 11th Amendment uh, dealing with courts and the states. Don't worry about that one. But this 12th Amendment is going to change the way the Electoral College system works. Now, it's still going to be on paper chosen by state legislatures, and there's still a lot of problems with it. But basically, the 12th Amendment says whenever these electors go to vote, they get one vote for president, 
one vote for vice president. No, no more of this two votes. We just get one for president, one for VP. Uh, it'll also clarify the rules about you know um, uh, breaking the ties in the House and things like that. But no longer we're going to have this confusion like we had right here in this election of 1800. Um, another thing that's going to happen here is Jefferson's going to take over, and as, we're going to talk about his presidency a little bit later. He's going to call this election of 1800 because we are going to see this transition of power to the Republicans. It's going to be very peaceful. I mean, it, it is. It, hypothetically, the uh, Federalists could have said, I'm not accepting Jefferson as president. I'm going to grab my gun, and we're just going to start fighting him. I mean, you see that still in countries today around the world. If one party takes over, another party doesn't like, the other party just grabs their gun and uh, and starts fighting. Well, that's not going to happen here. Basically, the Federalists accept the results of the election, and as we're going to see, they're not going to exactly like what Jefferson does, but they're going to respect what the Constitution dictated here, and they're going to accept uh, respect his presidency. Um, by the way, though, the Federalists realize, guys, we got a problem. These Republicans have been talking about democracy. Now we're seeing more and more states lift property restrictions on voting. We're seeing more and more states allow the people to, to directly vote for who their electors are going to vote. We're the party that says the people are the mob. We're going to have some problems here. As a matter of fact, um, Adams, shortly before leaving office, he's going to appoint a bunch of uh, federal judges uh, to the, the Federalist Party because he's so worried the Republicans are uh, taking over the presidency. And, by the way, they won both houses of Congress in the election of 1800. So at least we got to control uh, the judicial branch. But what are we going to do as our party in the future? So this is going to be a, a, a thing to come out of this election of 1800. So the final thing, and one of the things that's probably most interesting that will come out here is this is going to start a major rivalry between former Secretary of the Treasury, one of the heads of the Federalist Party, if not the head, Alexander Hamilton, and now Vice President, although nobody's inviting him, Thomas Jefferson's obviously not inviting him to the cabinet meetings and you know company picnics or anything like that. So the sitting Vice President now absolutely hates this Alexander Hamilton, former Secretary of the Treasury, one of the founders of the American economic system. These guys absolutely hate each other's guts, and they will for a while. Now, for the next couple of years, we're not going to see this rivalry go to anything because Burr, he's still got to serve as VP. He sits in the Senate. Um, he's not going to really do anything important there. Again, Jefferson's not going to be inviting him out. Hamilton, he actually serves in private law from 1800 to 1804. Um, at this point in his life, he actually starts adopting Christianity. Some people think it might, it's not sincere, it might just be to create like a coalition between Christians and Federalists to sort of revitalize the Federalist Party. Um, but these guys are out of, you know, each other's fear until 1804. What's going to happen in 1804 is Jefferson obviously not going to put v Burr on his, uh, uh, run with Burr, uh, as his VP in 1804. He saw what happened the first time, so he's going to pick a different guy to be his VP. So that means Burr's about to be out of a job coming up in 1805. So Burr's going to decide in 1804, you know, I need a job. Why don't I run as a Federalist? Because I basically switch parties. The Republicans turn their back on me after what happened in 1800. So why don't I run as a Federalist for this new job that's opening up in New York, the governor of New York? I'd like to run as the candidate for the Federalist for the governor of New York. So after I'm done with VP, I'll go serve as governor there. So again, knowing the Republicans won't make him their candidate, he starts going to these Federalist Party functions in New York where he starts pushing the idea, hey, let me be your candidate for governor. Let me be your candidate for governor. Well, Hamilton, he's still involved in Federalist Party politics. He hears what Burr's doing, didn't think he should be president, also doesn't think he should be governor of New York, especially uh, not for, you know, not his party's candidate. And so at these parties, Hamilton will basically say to the Federalists, don't back this guy. This guy's still dangerous. You know, I talked smack about him in 1800. I'm going to say it now. He's dangerous. I don't want him a member of my party. I don't want him as governor of New York. So for these reasons, we're going to see the Federalists in New York will not make Burr their candidate. He's not going to be the Federalist Party's candidate for governor in, in New York in 1804. Uh, 
Well, Burr will learn that Hamilton has once again been interfering in his affairs, calling him things like dangerous, uh, and he's denied him this chance to serve as governor of New York. So Burr, having heard Hamilton talk smack, in order to prove he's not dangerous, he's going to challenge Alexander Hamilton to a duel, because what other way to prove you're not dangerous than to challenge somebody to a contest where you shoot at each other? So what dueling was, and there are a couple different rules for this, is basically you would get two guys and they would have seconds or these guys that would come along with them uh, and what they would do and depends on you know the laws in various states throughout the United States at this time I think dueling's illegal just about every state though there uh, might be some states with lesser punishment and we'll talk about that more in a second but you would somebody would insult somebody and then dudes and this I don't think women did this if there's a women duel then I don't know about it but just dudes are dumb whenever somebody talks smack about you you challenge them to fight or whatever so dudes would hear somebody challenge somebody or somebody say something bad about them and you would say I challenge you to a duel and then you would meet this other person at a designated spot again depending on the legality of the situation you know way off in the woods or whatever and you'd be accompanied by your second so like your best friend and they'd be bringing a box with a single shot pistol in it with uh, with them then you get each get your pistol you'd you know get up face each other and you'd be like oh you're a jerk I hate you and then you would turn your back towards one another then you would walk 20 paces away and you walk 20 paces away and then you would turn around. When you turn around, it's not going to be like the Wild West. There's not any ch -ch -ch shooting like that. Uh, what you would do is basically one person usually would just aim their gun and try to hit the other person. Now, if you want to be the first to aim, you're probably you know, going a little bit for speed because you want to uh, do it before the other guy, and you shoot. Now, these are very inaccurate pistols. Maybe you hit the other guy, maybe that person falls over dead and maybe they can't fire their weapon but if you miss or you don't do that much damage that other guy now has as much time as he wants to aim and fire his weapon as you at you so it's sort of a uh, gamble whether you want to shoot first but you know maybe the second guy shoots you and then whoever isn't dead won the contest you're not a punk or whatever but that's not what normally happens majority of time in these duels what would happen is the two guys would go out they would grab their guns. And by the way, whenever they grab their guns, usually the seconds would turn around so they wouldn't be witness to what could be considered a murder. But they would usually back up uh, to one another, march their 20 paces, and then when they turn around, they look at each other and said, you know, I hate your guts, but damn if you're not brave for being here. And they'd both aim their guns in the air, fire uh, fire their weapons in the air, and then they go, man, I, I love you, SOB. And you, you go up and you'd hug it out, and then you each go your separate ways, and somehow this proves that you're men. You know, like just again, we dudes are weird. You get in a fight with somebody, punch each other, but the fight's broken up. You're all crying, like, I love you. I can't believe you fought. You know, well, let's be best friends. And then you're best friends forever. So that's what normally happened here. They fire their weapon in the air, and people go on their way. And that's actually what Hamilton assumes is going to happen when Burr challenges him to this duel. And we know that Burr, uh, Hamilton assumes this because he writes this all down. He basically writes, I think Burr is trying to save his honor, um, and so I'm going to go out there and I'm going to fire my gun in the air because I think that's uh, you know, what he's going to do as well. So they're both in New York, uh, but dueling in New York carries a really he heavy punishment. So they're going to decide to cross the river into New Jersey to do dueling. Dueling's illegal there, but the punishment's really light. So they're each going to bring their seconds, and they will arrive at this spot. It's actually interesting because a couple years before, Hamilton's uh, oldest son had been killed in a duel at the same spot. But, you know, it's a, kind of the dueling spot where people from New York went to do their duels. But Hamilton and Burr will line up, and they're going to face off against one another. And uh, they're going to each get their pistol, and they're going to turn and walk 20 paces. Now, at this point, everybody there except for the two men are going to turn around so they're not witnesses. Because, again, you know, if you see what happens, you have to testify in court. You, uh, you don't want to be a witness to, to a murder. So they both turn around. So we don't know exactly what happens, but we assume Hamilton is going to do what he said he was going to do in the letter. Take his gun and fire in the air, because the witnesses here, gunshot, 
and they're going to hear a bullet whiz through the leaves. And so we think that was Hamilton firing up. Let's hug it out. We, you know, so we, we think that's what happens. So Hamilton fires his single shot pistol in the air. Burr, essentially what we think it happens, again, he's the only witness uh, here. He's going to say, you done fucked up. And he will uh, then aim his pistol at Alexander Hamilton and boom, shoot Hamilton and uh, and kill Hamilton. And uh, well, not immediately. Hamilton will get shot. He's going to fall to the ground. He's going to spend the next couple hours bleeding out. So let, let me just be clear on what happened here. This sitting vice president, he's still vice president. He's getting ready to run for New York governor, but he's still VP has just shot the head of the Federalist Party, or the founder of the Federalist Party, still a prominent member, the former Secretary of the Treasury, the guy that created the financial system, the guy that, by the way, at this point, the U.S. is pretty much out of debt, the guy that put the U.S. on the map, put the U.S. in the direction of becoming this industrialized nation, that guy is na now laying on the ground bleeding out. Um, if you ever watch the, uh, what is it, uh, Lazy Sunday cartoon dropping Hamiltons like Aaron Burr. Like he literally just dropped Alexander Hamilton and shot him. Now it's going to be interesting because Burr now still has to go back to uh, Jefferson and basically serve as VP for a little bit while longer. And Jefferson, you can imagine, like what the you know I didn't like Hamilton either. You didn't have to do that. And uh, Burr, he he was going to recognize his, his political opportunities are going to be very. Uh, not going to have very many after this, but he's going to go on and do his thing. Um, Hamilton, I, I don't know if he, at this point, he'd been, in part because of his interference with uh, the previous elections, his sort of pressure against Adams, he'd been on the outs for the Federalist Party. I legit think he was trying to come up with ways for the Federalist Party to return to his former glory. But really, without him, we're going to see this Federalist Party already in a tough spot with the increased democracy is going to become e even more in a tough uh, spot with Hamilton's death. Uh, interesting, Hamilton, he, he wrote a series of notes to his family members uh, before uh, before he, he met Burr in, in case he died. Um, uh, by the way, this is a, a celebration for him, you know, a, a, a mourning. Uh, in 1804 when when he was shot there's a whole New York shut down that type of thing uh, but he wrote these letters this one is to his wife um, this letter my dear Eliza will not be delivered to you unless I shall first have terminated my earthly career to begin as I humbly hope from redeeming grace and divine mercy a happy immortality so he'd adopted Christianity by this point the consolations of religion my beloved can only support you, and these you have a right to enjoy. Fly the bosom of your God and be comforted. With my last idea, I shall cherish the sweet hope of meeting you in a better world. Do best of wives and best of women. Embrace all my darling children for me. So sad. But remember, he cheated on her, like all the time. But anyway, that is uh, the end of Hamilton. Uh, what we're going to talk about next time is what Thomas Jefferson is going to do and what the Republicans are going to do now that they're in charge.